think we can say that is a common observation that in today's world we are we focus more on the question of how rather than why is it reasonable to distinguish between these two questions and in general what was your primary motivations on science physics and nanotechnology well that's what they teach you in the university that science don't answer the 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 question, uh, the of, question why. of why so that's uh, that you are as a scientist and as an observer you are you you're just a bystander you you observe the system you don't question why you there, there is metaphysics there is philosophy which might might not be able to answer this this question why of course it, it doesn't stop you as an individual try to try to ask this this question but in science we still what we do we generally just interrogate nature and we try to understand how it uh, how it works and i don't think we are in the position even to be able to 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 pose this question yet we don't we, we there are still so many white spots which we, which we don't understand at all so i would say it's probably premature to ask why at the moment mm -hmm. And the second part of the question, what was your primary motivation uh, in general uh, for uh, science and uh, nanotechnology? Well, I, I, uh, I like physics, so, and so since how I can remember myself, it was really fun for me to, to explore uh, this world with the use of some uh, basic principles of physics and some basic uh, basic uh, experimental setup so it's still back back from my school maybe there were some other smaller arguments for for that when when going to the university then there was a time when I need to choose the my speciality and condensed metaphysics and technology is what what I do now and I just like the the personal nature of this of the science that myself as an individual I can come with an idea, make make a device, uh, interrogate it, and make some make some conclusion, make a model, just uh, explore mm -hmm. explore new phenomena. It's it's much more personal than than other other areas of science. It doesn't make it better or worse. It just suits my 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 personality much better so that's what i and i enjoy doing all my life mm -hmm. yes and um, how do you see the development of the of uh, science and technology in the 21st century especially in terms of their impact of um, communication the general sense of, of freedom uh, security and safety on culture or nature it's probably a complex uh, question but it's complex and again it's beyond it's beyond the uh, responsibility of a scientist to answer to, to this question so uh, the the beauty of science the beauty may be a tragedy and maybe the complexity of science is that uh, we answer, we try to answer very very complex uh, very complicated questions so we try to find new new knowledge and it's just something you try to find something which doesn't exist and it's um, so that's the difference between science and and engineering in engineering you need to find a solution to a particular problem and you know that this solution always exists so there are, there are combinations of technologies which you can combine and create and 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 create these solutions in science, we we search for 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 something for for new knowledge, but this new knowledge, this new breakthrough, this new discovery might may not lie just uh, along the pathway we, we, which you are taking. Maybe at a certain moment you need to say, okay, it's not there. You have to you have to switch this this pathway. And that's really uh, that's what people don't uh, often don't realize that there is a quite a quite quite a difference between engineering technology and and pure science and that's why when you create this new knowledge you have absolutely no clue how it's going and if it's going to be used uh, all the prehistory of science 
we see that sooner or later these those scientific knowledge start to be applied in our technology and frankly we would be nowhere if not for, for science every everything around us was once science we were once unknown knowledge which which scientists uh, discovered so um, so it's very i think there is a connection between modern technologies and science but it's not it's not very straightforward so lots of the technologies which we use now can be traced really just to many many decades ago so we created I don't know quantum mechanics, and we and 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 we started to 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 study uh, semiconductors, and we are here now with just with using this camera, this uh, this this computer, and so on. So we have no idea uh, which new technologies, our new discoveries, are going to 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 bring to us mm-hmm. but we do know that the technology of the future will be most probably very different from from what it is today so no one would predict you 70 years ago that we would have the the, the computers of today and the kind of telecommunication of, of today yes and actually it's a good introduction for my next question We can read in your biography that you are interested in art. And because of that, I, I need to ask you, is it possible to understand, actually, science without understanding art and philosophy and vice versa? Uh, do art and philosophy always depend on scientific discoveries as much as on the inspiration well, or dialects? So so generally, I, I would I usually don't don't uh, like when, when people interconnect science and art together and they say okay you you, you need to study art because it just uh, unleashes your your brain and so on but there is a, a connection on on some level and it's it's exactly coming back to, to the question of how do we make our our discoveries and and uh, in that sense it's a very similar question of how people create masterpieces and i mean before studying art so I, i would say people just listening to those artists talking about inspiration mm-hmm. and just that they need to get into a certain mood me being a completely rational person yes. I, would say, i would say come on you either can paint or you cannot paint what kind of inspiration are, yes. are you talking about starting practicing art i can tell you You, there is absolutely no no chance you can do any painting without inspiration. How to produce inspiration, we don't know. We don't have recipes. And in that sense, it's same as how, how can you produce a discovery. You cannot plan a discovery. And I have no idea how discoveries are, are coming. I mean, not that I do it regularly, but... Uh, But it's really it's it's quite a, it's there is no there is no rule and there is no guarantee that that you will make it and it's just uh, I'm not even sure if we make it or we just uh, we just listen to the background noise of scientific knowledge by reading papers listening to the uh, to the uh, presentations at the conferences looking at your own data and then somehow all this combination eventually just trigger some if not breakthrough but new connection between between the data and 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 just uh, and, and you you create this new language which we which we call a discovery so i think they that the two processes are connected but on much much deeper level trying to mm-hmm. understand how our brain creates new languages and and uh, new new understanding and and new knowledge and and honestly practicing art help help me to understand this this connection i still don't have recipes but it still it it helped me to understand that the, that, that this connection exists mm-hmm. yes uh, i agree with that and uh, i would like to ask you in your view who are the primary opponents of science knowledge and creativity in this today's world um to be honest not that I particularly care 
I mean, I have my 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 science, which I which I enjoy doing, and we have a, com- a community of of people who are enthusiastic of uh, of science. So we just scientific community across the globe. It's not too big. It's not. It's not. It's not too little, and um, it's of course it's very difficult to convey your enthusiasm about science to general audience. It doesn't always doesn't always happen. It's, it's it's even harder to convey to the to the to the politician. But I won't call an every Joe or a politician of an course. opponent. It's uh, it's it's. I think it's the normal. Is the normal development of the of, of of our society. So some people are interested in science. We believe that it might be useful for the future. But frankly, we do, we do our science not because it, it might be useful, but because it is just you cannot you cannot not do it. Mm-hmm. So uh, the only big big enemy is probably uh, uh, is probably untruth. Mm-hmm. And I don't know how to uh, how to even even formulate it, but it's also it's not the enemy of the science; it's the enemy of the scientists. And I mean, I don't I don't want to align myself as a scientist to the to the science. I'm just I'm just a small uh, just a small contributor. And and luckily, surprisingly. Science is extremely robust, and uh, it is robust against against the untruths, against the wrong experiments, and that. So the structure of science and how we do science creates this mechanism, which uh, which cleans itself up from the from from from, from those non-true experiments and and the and and the untrue discoveries. So, uh, as I said, it might be an enemy of particular scientists because you, you can be misled into mm-hmm. the uh, false direction and so on. But science as a whole, it has it, those mechanisms of protecting itself, which uh, it's, which, we, which makes me really happy. And that's, uh, I think that's, uh, that's important that, that we stick with those. And what about retrograde ideologies or radical conservatism in that context? Um, I, I can only say that I'm pity for that, and 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 uh, I, I I don't think it will globally it will stop it will stop science. So it can lead to the redistribution of scientific mm-hmm. discoveries. I, w- I would say yes. humans are talented reasonably equally across the the globe, and uh, the country or the area place which managed to attract more talents so because there are i don't know 100 talents per, per in physics per thousand population in montenegro and it's the same 100 per, per thousand in in united states and and or in china or or or, or in russia or, or in the in the uh, in the united kingdom now if you want to boost your your science the only way how you can do it is to attract more more talents you slightly deplete them in one place you and you stand and you slightly enhance them in in another place so what we do so globally across the globe i think the rate of discoveries is is only growing mm-hmm. so the science is only is only prevailing but we do see areas which get depleted of 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 talents because typically what happens you cannot suppress science in total you just Push those talented people uh, to, to go to, to go to move to the places where they are supported better. Uh, so globally, it doesn't change it dramatically. It creates some fluctuations, but not but, but not terribly big. But uh, eventually, so eventually the science will survive. But we will see the redistribution and the more discoveries are made in in one places than 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 in the others. Observers. Yes. Okay. The, this is my last question. Uh, this is uh, Central University Library podcast, and of course, I need to ask you uh, how you see libraries in new digital age. Well, I have I have a, a bit of a mixed feeling about this. So mm-hmm. personally, I like I, I like libraries. So I have. 
I, should, I, I don't have a, a proper home at the moment, so just I, I, I'm a, a bit on the move, and um, but I'm, I, I, I'm preparing that maybe I will retire one day, and uh, I have my collection of books, which I really hope to arrange it into a proper library. So I, I like those books and strange books and and, and so on. Uh, so in that sense, access to physical books is amazing for me. So and I really, I really love it. At the same time, being uh, being a practical scientist, I really want all the information at my fingertip. Mm-hmm. So I can only carry so many books in my in, in my mobile phone. So it's a I have tiny electronic library which I just I can open some poetry on a, on a plane or just and read some of my favorite books just in case I'm stuck there and I really want 10 minutes to to, to lose my favorite books but in general I would still uh, I, I love this ability to to have uh, any information at my at my fingertips so access to the electronic, materials mm-hmm. is extremely important and the fact that I work I was always lucky to work in good universities which which have very good subscriptions to all the latest journals that's extremely important of course so moving digital I think it's going to happen and it brings a lot of convenience, speed up our, our, our work dramatically. I mean, I'm still from the generation who used to go to actual physical library and yes. just read, read articles there. So now it's, uh, it, so okay. what, what we have now is speed up the, the rate of, of, of science dramatically. So I don't know what's, what's going to happen. So for myself, I will try to keep both um uh, alive so and, and but uh, as i said we cannot predict what kind of future technologies we are going to have can we have a chip planted in our in our brain with all the libraries there or already maybe okay we will see uh, professor nosel uh, it was really pleasure and honor to have you here to to hear your thoughts and thank you very much indeed thank you so much for the interesting questions thank you thank you